I have a short little presentation and uh, just again reminds us to look probably a little bit closer to our stamps when we are looking at them. You know, I like to fly spec or call it what you'd like. Um, and I'm going to keep my match and medicine theme going with my private dies. Uh, if you recall, you know, those were also uh, engraved by uh, Butler uh, Carpenter and a number of others uh, that we're used to uh, seeing from this era. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, and I'm going to try to get my screen set up a little bit differently. So there we go. Uh, and I can present. So what I'll tell you tonight is, again, a reminder to look closely at your stamps. And if you can't look at them under 5X or 10X, to uh, look at them, you know, make a scan of them. Uh, uh, if you have a flatbed scanner and get them on your computer, and then you can highlight them and, and, and increase them. And so here's a little story about C.B. Woodworth and Son in Perishable Perfumes. And after looking at, I don't know, a couple of hundred of these over many years, eventually you will find the elusive double transfer. And this one's on silk paper and it just happens to have a catalog of RT20VI. I'll give you a little brief history of this perfume company, very successful perfume company. But here's an example of a bottle that I have, a blue uh, by Woodworth out of Rochester, New York. Uh, and so this is triple extract and they have blue lilac and they, they really were, were very big in this era uh, for, for decades and decades and decades. Um, Here's a little background and a little bit history of the C.B. Woodworth and Son uh, out of Rochester, New York. They were founded by a Mitchell and Ezra Taylor in 55 in Rochester. But shortly thereafter, only a year later, uh, in 1856, did a Chauncey B. Woodworth uh, and a Reuben A. Bennell acquire the company. And so C.B. Woodworth, I found a picture and an image of him. Uh, we just heard a little bit about trade cards and advertisement and marketing. Uh, uh, from Bob's talk. And so th this is from a similar era, a little bit earlier, but nonetheless, they also, to push their wares, did a lot of marketing. And there's an example of a trade card with a man and a woman on a, on a, on a boat uh, out, in the, uh, out in, the, in the wild, uh, on the water. Uh, and this is, again, an advertisement for their perfumes. There's also an advertisement at the far right, as for Woodworth's Blue Lilies, a perfume concentrated et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Came in a beautiful bottle. Uh, there in the middle is an example of the bottle that I have, which is a garden fragrance bottle. It's beautifully blown uh, glass. Uh, it's got a little placard on there on the front that has the name of the company with, with the garden fragrance on it, uh, Woodworth name of the company and a, a stopper at the top that is, that is colored in dark that's sort of engraved, if you will. Really very, very beautiful uh, a bottle. Uh, they were one of the earliest American perfume houses and produced a lot of products, perfumes, soaps, toiletry articles. And then they also produced glassware for perfumes and other related products, um, compacts, et cetera, et cetera. Really very, very uh, uh, large company. And by 1877, of 1870, the glass manufacturer had stopped and they really just focused all on the perfumery with their model being nothing but the best. Uh, you could find their items really all over. Uh, advertising cards for their blue lilies, as I've shown, promoted their imperishable perfumes with all these extracts, et cetera, et cetera. And the company was so successful here in the United States and beyond that they were acquired by the French perfume house, uh, Bougeot, uh, and they were the first American perfume company to suffer this fate. They were that large and that they were doing that well to compete with the French perfume houses that they were they were acquired, I have no doubt for probably a pretty good sum. I don't think that the the family uh, was complaining, but they really were very very large and sold their wares all over. That's a little backstory about the company, which you know I like because I like to collect not only the stamps but any of the other materials, like what I've shown here. And so they issued um, their own private die stamps. We heard a little bit about that as well. Again, early marketing, early advertising. This would have been on their bottles, on their products. And they issued two denominations. One was RT20. It was the one cent green stamp here on the left. Uh, and that was issued in March of 1872. And they had a pretty good run until 1883. They issued almost 2.5 million of those on silk paper. And they issued 4.4 on both pink and watermark paper. Um, and they also issued a two cent blue stamp uh, issued in 77, 
little bit later than the first, and then uh, again to about 83, they did not print a lot of the two cent stamp, only about 285,000. Uh, that's total printings on all three different types of paper, silk, pink, and watermark paper. Uh, and so two pretty little stamps. These are the size of a definitive, a U.S. definitive stamp. And you can see the advertising with the picture of Woodworth on the front, C.B. Woodworth and Son in ARC with Rochester, New York on the bottom. And then to meet the requirements of the government at the time for the tax, you had one cent, you had one in all four corners and U.S. internal revenue and proprietary. And so, you know, these were engraved and Butler, uh, I think Carpenter, oh, oh Carpenter and Al, no, it was Butler um, in Philly was, I think, uh, uh, chosen to actually design and make these stamps for them. Uh, and I'm going to show you just an example of a normal stamp on the left. Um, and then this one, you kind of, I thought my eyes, I was looking double when I first saw this one in a pile um, where you can just make, and I'll, I'll, I'll blow it up. You can just start to see some stray ink in the white areas here in internal revenue. You can see a little bit of a double ink here, what it looks like in the C and B and some of the dots. You definitely can see some extra ink here uh, around the NY and the R. Uh, you even have this stray line here, this uh, horizontal line just below proprietary here in the margin. Uh, and this is on silk paper. Here's a normal, my normal copy on silk paper as well. You can see some of the fibers. We're all used to seeing those like we do in, in other revenue stamps. Um, and they were issued, these were issued in sheets of 210. And now let me blow it up. And again, I, I first saw this by looking under just, you know, 10X. But then I did some scans, flatbed scans uh, at 600 or 1200 DPI just to really blow it up. And here's an example of the normal one at top, U.S. Internal Revenue. Here's a little guide dot. If you know about how they laid out these various plates, the stenographer would you know, lay guide dots down and then they would rock in the transfer roll. And there's a guide dot, which helped to rock in this stamp. And if you look here at the top, and I've circled it in yellow, you can see a downward shift of about one to one and a half millimeters. And you see in the U and the S and the I and the N and the T and the E and the R all the way across you could see a, a shift down south. You could also see a little bit of a shift here in the white space below, even into this white space of this entire label being shifted down. Here is the bottom of the stamp. The proprietary piece of the normal one is at the top. And here you also see uh, the doubling. It's not as pronounced below here in the letters, although you do see a little bit uh, of the ink that comes down below, but you do see this extra line here uh, at the lower right, even a little bit farther. And that's this lower frame line from an over, from a doubling when it was rocked in and then rocked in again. Uh, and then this was of course took up ink and then was printed. Uh, and that's what you see here's a full double transfer. I also blew up uh, and did a comparison of the normal stamp here at the top. And you could then also see this double transfer here at the bottom. And it is quite pronounced in almost every letter of uh, C.B. Woodworth and Son. You have a little bit of the C here and the dot in the B, doubling of the W, the O, even in the D. And as you come around the arc, a little bit extra on the T, the H, and then here you see it in the Sun. Uh, and so pretty pronounced. I just chose one of the corners to show the doubling here. You'll see the stray lines in, in the one and the shift down. You'll see an extra straight line here. Even in the one, and the one is on the right, the left side. I chose this one here and I just flipped it 90 degrees. So you can see it here. Here's a normal example. And here again is a doubling in the O and in the E. There's a little bit of ink below. So again, this was shifted down. And then finally, I think this is the last slide, is just showing in the Rochester, New York, um, the R and the O. You'll see the stray ink here the O below the C, and you'll see all the extra doubling down as it shifted down, especially in the dot and the N and the Y. So you can really see this double transfer. And so really just wanted to share that with you as you're looking through your stamps. And these are not common, uh, but they're not hard to find if you know what to look for. And if you ever think you're looking at something and it looks a little fuzzy, uh, as this stamp did to me, take a closer look and pull it out off on the side you might be surprised that you found a double transfer. Uh, again, like I said, not common, but they are out there. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what I wanted to share with you, just to give you a little overview as, as you're looking through your stamps on or off cover, 
you know, knowing the engraving process and how they did these back then in that period, uh, double transfers are, are out there. Uh, and uh, it takes a stamp that's a pretty common stamp to something that's probably one in a couple thousand. And again, they didn't print many of them. So to find one with the, the census that exists out there is, is a pretty neat find. And it has a space in my book right next to that. So I'll stop there. I'll take any questions. But again, just really a simple overview to remind you to take a look uh, at your holdings. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to share a little double transfer with you. Thank you, Charlie. Just a comment that I have. I remember as a kid, my mother and grandmother saved old perfume bottles and yeah. seeing that remind me. And some of these things were pretty old, you know, more than just what evening in Paris or something, but they still had smells to them. Yes. Yes. It's amazing. Off. Yes. Yeah. It is amazing. They still do maintain some of that little aroma if, if you keep that stopper on there long enough. I agree. Yeah. I guess maybe it's the ground glass. I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know. I think it also has to probably do with how well it was preserved and how, you know, did it just over time evaporate and let leave a little bit of that, you know, uh, uh, residue right on the inside or on the bottom. You can still find these intact, actually, that still contain a, yeah. a little bit, even after all this time. I do have a number of other bottles, perfume bottles, that still have the original stamp on them. Nice. It's something that I can show at, a, at another time yeah, yeah. where they still have the, the private dye proprietary stamp on it from mm -hmm. like the one we just showed, Rochester, uh, New York from Woodward, or they'll have a general U.S. issue revenue proprietary one, two cent. So the general issued ones uh, from uh, from your, your your back of your stock catalog. So you can still find them with the stamp on them, which is always neat. Uh, if you keep looking, they're out there. So yeah, thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charlie. Charlie? Yeah, uh, sure. It's definitely a short question. Sure. <laughs> that happens to stamps worldwide or is it kind of a, a U.S. issue? Um, oh, double. Oh. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, any stamps that were engraved that were, you know, put onto a transfer roll that were, uh, you know, laid onto a plate and most of the worldwide stamp, most countries in those early days used the engra engraved stamps. You, you'll find double transfers, shifted transfers like this all across the globe on all sorts of issues, starting from the earliest days that stamps are printed stamps. So you can find these pretty uh, pretty worldwide until you move to more modern printing. You just don't see that offset right, printing. Right. You don't see that on offset printing. You see double impressions. You don't get these double transfers. So in, this, in these early engraved stamps that you had to rock onto a plate with the transfer roll, you, you will invariably find uh, not just double transfers. You could find triple transfers. And, you know, on the one cent and three cent 1851, uh, uh, there are triple transfers as well. Um, in multiple directions. And so, so they're out there, Steve. You can absolutely find them. Yep, definitely. All right, thank you. You're welcome.